Hello and welcome to this module on evading IDS firewalls and honeypots. Let's see what we'll be covering in this theoretical video. We'll kick off with what is an IDS, a firewall and a honeypot, and then we'll move on to the different types of IDSs, firewalls and honeypots. Then we'll look at the different evasion techniques, and then finally we'll end off with countermeasures. Let's get started. So let's start off with a firewall and let's look at the definition. A firewall is a network security device that monitors traffic to or from your network. It allows or blocks traffic based on a defined set of security rules. So if you've been in IT for longer than a week, you should know what a firewall is. It's basically a device or a piece of software that usually sits on the perimeter of a network and creates a boundary between the trusted network and the untrusted network. So and basically the way it, it accomplishes this is by a set of security rules. So in other words, it opens and blocks ports, it looks at the packets that are flowing through its um, interfaces and looks for malicious traffic or looks for specific rules that it is destined or programmed to look for which it then blocks or allows. Let's move on. An IDS. An IDS is an intrusion detection system which inspects all inbound and outbound network activity and identifies suspicious patterns that may indicate a network or system attack. So what does that pretty much mean? Well, the best way to think of an IDS is as an alarm system. That's basically what it does. It sits once again on the perimeter or between a trusted and untrusted network. Sometimes you can have an IDS sitting totally in the trusted network, just looking at all traffic. And what it does is it looks at every single packet and then matches these two rules that are set either via anomaly or signatures or integrity, but we'll cover that a little later. And then depending on the rule, it will either alert you that something is going on or just allow the traffic to go past and unalerted for want of a better word. And that's pretty much what it is. So it's just an alarm system that pretty much monitors and if it sees something that it thinks is a problem, it'll alert you. Then we have what's called an IPS. And an IPS is an intrusion prevention system. And if you look at the definition, it's pretty much the same as an IDS. The only difference is that an IPS also has the artificial intelligence built in to actually block traffic or quarantine traffic before it alerts you. So think of it as an armed response to your um, alarm system. So an alarm system just alarms you, but the armed response will also come in and pretty much stop whatever's happening if there is a problem. So that that's pretty much the difference. An IDS is just an alarm, an IPS actually takes action on the alarm before it alerts you. Now firewalls, IDSs and IPSs can be network based, which is the traditional way. In other words, it sits on the network and looks at network traffic, but they can also be host based. So you can actually put a firewall on a host, you can put an IDS on a host, you can put an IPS on a host to protect the specific server, or service or application. And you'll see in the literature you have HIDS and HIPS, that stands for host, and you get the NIPS, NIDS and NIPS for the networks. Firewalls we discussed, you get a normal network firewall, but you also get things like a web application firewall, which does pretty much the same thing for web applications. So you need to bear in mind that these terms are generic and can relate to a network, an entire environment, or just a specific host or service or application. Okay, let's move on. And then the final thing we discuss in this module is a honeypot. And a honeypot is a decoy computer. It's pretty much a computer that's been set up by a security person generally that has a lot of vulnerabilities that you put out there to pretty much decoy and see what attackers are actually doing. So sometimes you can use a honeypot to pretty much mislead people. In other words, you put the honeypot right next to the real application and hope that they go for that because it's more vulnerable rather than attack your, your prime production application. But it's also more used for learning and for collection, collecting malware on the internet. Um, and that is pretty much what all the security companies use when they start writing malware signatures. They actually have thousands of honeypots all over the world on different networks and they sit there and collect malware that's floating around worms, viruses, trojans, and then they collect these samples and then write signatures for them. That's pretty much what a honeypot is. Great, let's move on and look at the different types of these services and systems. 
let's start with firewalls. So the really generic firewall, the one that's been around for since the dawn of time, I suppose, is the multi-home firewall. And it pretty much has two interfaces, one for the trusted network and one for the untrusted network. And that pretty much is how it sits in the middle and then either passes or denies traffic. That's multi-home firewall. You then also get DMZ firewalls. And that's also just a um, an architecture decision. So what a DMZ firewall is, it's got three legs. So it's got one leg for the untrusted network. So traffic flows into the untrusted network. It then flows traffic to the, what's called the DMZ, which is which sits between the trusted and untrusted network. And that's generally where you put things like web servers. So you put your web server in the DMZ. And then in your trusted network, you put your database so that your data is protected by for all intents and purposes, two firewall rules and your web server by one firewall rule because you want traffic to the web server to be as quick as possible. And you, you do this by a DMZ firewall which has three, pretty much three interfaces, one for the trusted network, one for the DMZ and one for the trusted network. Then you have the types of firewalls, the, the generic or the classic type of firewall is a packet filter and it does layer four filtering. So it pretty much looks at a packet and says this is SSH traffic, it blocks it. This is HTTP traffic and it allows it depending on the rule. It usually allows it from a source to a destination. Um, and it does this by looking at the TCP and UDP packets and then filtering on the actual packet type. It either filters it by the port number, by the protocol or by the source and IP addresses. Then the, the, the next generation firewalls are actually application layer 7 firewalls and what they do is what's called deep packet inspection and deep packet inspection pretty much looks at the actual packet and looks at the content of the packet and looks for malicious code or specific rules that you've created in the packet that says um, a good example is content filtering. So in other words if the URL is from a violence or terrorism site, you must block it. That is an example of an application firewall doing that. And a lot of firewalls actually do that now and it's probably the next generation. Then you've got um, the, the, the next thing that you'll hear about application firewalls is that they're stateful. Now the stateful firewalls are able to actually manage the TCP connection. In other words, they actually understand the, the routing of the packet and actually understand the sequence so that they can make a state decision on should they allow the traffic or not. And that pretty much are the different kinds of firewalls that you'll find out there. Then in IDS and IPS you have three types. The first one is an integrity check. So what an integrity check IDS and IPS does, it pretty much monitors a set of system files and it looks for changes in them. As soon as a change is made, it will alert you. Um, and you'll see an example of this in the demo that I've prepared. Um, and it's pretty good for uh, managing things like password files and things that shouldn't be changing on systems and services. Specifically, in a Windows environment, your application DLL, in, in your Linux environment, your systems and services directories. Then you get the signature and rule-based IDS and IPS, and these are the most popular. And what these do is it looks for specific signature rules, pretty much like an application firewall does. It looks for specific um, detectors in a packet and then will alert you or block it, depending if it's an IDS or IPS, based on the rules that it makes. Obviously, the downfall of this kind of um, IDS and IPS is if you change the packet slightly so that it has a different hash value or a different look and feel, it's going to pass through the IDS and IPS without being detected. And then the latest uh, generation of IDS and IPS are behavioral or anomaly based. So what they do is you put your IDS and IPS in learn mode and then it watches your network, your system, your services for a while and baselines normal activity. Then when you put it into detected mode, it then starts looking for anomalous behavior. So a very good example is Microsoft's advanced threat analytics gateway. So what that thing would do is it will monitor the network and it will monitor all the different systems and services. So for example, if a salesman's laptop all of a sudden wants to make an FTP connection, it will alert you because guess what? While it was doing its learning, 
the sales team has never had to make an FTP connection. And that's how the behavior and anomaly IDS and IPSs work. Then in honeypots, there are two really big different types. There's the low interaction honeypot, and those are the ones that you can't really interact with as a hacker or as an, as an attacker. And all they do is literally sit on the internet and absorb and consume malware, categorize it and put it into files so that you can analyze it later. The high interaction honeypots, these are the ones that the guys use to actually see how people are hacking into systems. So they'll put up a fake SSH server or a fake HTTP server and then watch the different attacks and then build rules in the IDSs and IPSs to actually block those attacks. So generally these three concepts or these three systems and services all go hand in hand and they all work together in unison to try and protect the network and this is what's called defense in depth so you have a honeypot out on the internet to start tracking behavior you have an ids and ips to actually alert you should that behavior be spotted and then you have your firewall to block traffic could be a um, malicious attempt at getting into your system now let's look at the different evasion techniques the first evasion technique I'd like to discuss is denial of service. Just like every other application service and server out there, IDSs, IPSs, firewalls and honeypots all have vulnerabilities that can be exploited. So you could take them offline, which would pretty much render them useless. And you could do this by means of taking advantage of a vulnerability in the actual application, or you could just flood the entire IDS, IPS or firewall with bogus traffic which would inundate the operators with false alerts thereby hiding the real alerts as they come through. The next attack we can do is character set changes. So a lot of the IDS, IPS firewalls they are specifically encoded to look for a specific character set like UTF-8 as an example. But if we recode our exploits or our vulnerabilities in let's say ASCII then guess what? they will pass through the IDS and IPS without being detected because they are using a different character set. Then we can look at hash manipulation and that also takes advantage of the rules-based vulnerability in that it only looks for specific hashes in the rule. So by looking at an exploit and recompiling it with just let's say a comment or an extra space, the entire hash of that vulnerability or that exploit will change so it won't be picked up by the IDS and IPS. Then the favorite one of all is encryption. So you could encrypt the traffic. Once it's encrypted, guess what? You can't do packet inspection. So as a result, you would then be hiding your traffic. Some firewalls and IDSs and IPSs would block this traffic, but generally encrypted traffic is allowed through because it's seen as trusted. And this is another way that you could evade these different devices and services. Then there's IP address spoofing. In other words, spoofing the, your original IP address so that people don't actually know where the attack is originating from. Although this will still raise an alert, it will protect your true identity and maybe using that with a flood attack would probably be a very good way of evading stuff. So you flood the IDS, IPS and firewall with bogus traffic, you also spoof your IP address and you're pretty much not seen. Then finally there's Tor and proxy chains which you use out on the internet. So Tor is the onion router and it's pretty much an anonymous network and proxy chains is a tool that you use in Kali Linux where you buy, um, route all your traffic through the Tor network and you can route Nmap through it and a whole bunch of other things and I'll show you that in the demo coming up. Let's move on and look at the countermeasures. First countermeasure is always to harden your devices and this is pretty much to prevent that denial of service that we discussed in the previous slide. And of course you do this by disabling services that are not needed on the actual application or server. Then you deploy layers and we discussed this as you deploy multiple layers of defense, defense in depth as it's known. So you use honeypots, you use IDSs, you use IPSs, you also have firewalls on your servers, you also have network segmentation. The best network is one with multiple layers of security. So if an attacker gets through one layer, there are multiple layers still to be challenged. And so he cannot actually get a free ride directly to the data or whatever it is that he's trying to do. 
You write IDS rules, and that also was covered in one of the slides we are discussed, where you use a honeypot to actually look at the different forms of attack that are coming out there. And then taking those attacks, you actually write the IDS rules that are specific for your organization, so that you are protected against future attacks by looking at anomalous behavior. Then there's patch management, as always, if your server services are up to date and have the latest critical updates in place, you are less vulnerable. And then you have to know your adversary, and this is where the honeypots come in. And know your adversary also works for the attacker. So as an attacker, what you should do is have a lab, have a lab of IDSs, have a lab of IPSs, have different firewalls, and before you actually start your penetration test, see what your scans, what your exploitations, and all of that look like on these devices, so that you can plan your attack using proper stealth and evasion. And then finally, for the environments that need protecting, if you, if you get a security alert, it's really important that the operator respond very, very rapidly. Obviously, if something's going down and an IDS is throwing up an alert that something is happening, this should be responded to very, very quickly and shouldn't be left for a week or two, because by then it might be too late. And that pretty much ends this theoretical video on the evasion techniques for IDSs, firewalls and honeypots. Thank you very much for watching.